distinguished guests, academic colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou, koutou. My name is Grant Kilford, the Vice-Chancellor of Victoria. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to this inaugural professorial lecture from Eric LaRue. Professor LaRue's expertise, which you will hear about this evening, is an illustration of the calibre of the staff we have at Victoria, New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and its first ranked university for research quality. Professor LaRue's research interests are in the emerging area of electromagnetism at the nanoscale, and in particular, nanoplasmonics, or the study and applications of the optical properties of sub-wavelength metallic objects. His work is at the leading edge of an exciting area of discovery and sits well with Victoria's commitment to fundamental research of high quality and impact, impact which has the potential to contribute to outcomes as diverse as stimulating our region's design-led high-value manufacturing economy and improving our health and well-being. Eric studied physics at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, Paris before completing the equivalent of a master's degree in quantum physics at Ecole Normale Supérieure, also in Paris. He obtained a PhD in 2002 working at Imperial College in London on semiconductor quantum dots for telecommunication applications. After completing a one-year postdoctoral position at Imperial College, Eric moved to New Zealand in 2004 to become a postdoctoral fellow at the McDowell Institute for Advanced Materials and Nanotechnology, based here in Victoria. In 2008, he became a lecturer in physics at Victoria, then a senior lecturer, then an associate professor, and now a professor. During his time here, he has taken up short-term positions as invited professors at universities in Switzerland and in France. Eric has had a stellar career since arriving in Victoria. In 2011, he was awarded a Rutherford Discovery Fellowship, joining an elite group of New Zealand's most talented early to mid-career researchers who are awarded these fellowships. He has also been principal investigator for two Marsden-funded research projects. Eric received a Victoria University Research Excellence Award in 2009 and was presented with the Research Medal of the New Zealand Association of Scientists in 2012. Eric makes a notable contribution to scientific publishing. He has over 100 scientific publications to his name, many of which are very regularly cited. He also serves on the editorial boards of several leading physics journals and is often invited to speak at conferences around the world. Eric's lecture tonight is titled Lasers, Nanoparticles and Single Molecule Detection. He will provide an overview of laser spectroscopy and discuss the use of gold and silver nanoparticles to help detect and identify a single molecule, arguably the ultimate analytical tool. He will explore the world of possibilities that could open up through applying his research in areas ranging from forensic testing to understanding the exact nature of cancerous cells and tumours. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Eric Lundry. to many experts on, on these things and uh, it's, uh, sorry. it's never quite uh, as uh, impressive as being here tonight in front of so many people, members of the public, some friends uh, from various activities, students, uh, family, um, my wife is here for the first time when I give a talk, that's probably the most scary part. <laughs> and, uh, so today I will try to give you a, a brief overview of the research um, that we're doing here at Victoria in this area. These two parts at the end will be uh, essentially uh, more our two examples of the research we're doing. And the rest is a bit of digression and background to explain where it fits in the, in the general um, uh, community. Um, so, the title of my talk, Laser, Nanoparticles and Single Detection, will give us, a, I'm sorry, will give us, uh, you know, the pathways, uh, but I'll talk about many other things on the way. Um, sorry. Uh, 
I'd like to start with acknowledgement. And here in the thank you corner, I've got uh, my three institutions, Victoria University of Wellington, the Magdalene Institute, and the Royal Society, for which I don't work directly, but uh, that have also been very good to me. Thanks to these three, uh, it's really, uh, they've been a great support for me over the last 10 years or so, and I wouldn't be here to, today without them. And obviously, a lot of the members of my group, so here I've got uh, pictures of every member of my group about over the last probably 10 years, past and present members, probably more than half of them are here, are here today. Uh, as you can see, it's quite an international bunch, uh, and uh, they've all contributed in one way or another to the research I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, they've helped me with that presentation, um, so I, I need to acknowledge them. Now there's one person missing, and many of you uh, knew uh, Pablo Echegoin. Uh, he was a professor of nanotechnology at Victoria here for 10 years, and he hired me 10 or 11 years ago when I came here as a postdoc. And basically, all the research I'm going to talk about, we've done really a lot of it together. Uh, we've run that book together. And uh, sadly, he passed away two years ago, but I think uh, he would be in our minds tonight. All right. Um, OK, so let's start uh, with light. Uh, our research is about light. Maybe I should try to get a bit less light, actually. Let's <laughs> start with this, if I can do that. Uh, lights, so that you can see what's going on. Oh, it's already on. Okay. Um, so this year uh, is quite fitting because it's the International Year of Light. So uh, there's a lot of activities around the world to celebrate uh, to celebrate light in all its um, uh, all its forms and all its applications. Uh, some of you might have been here. Uh, a few months ago, just next door, in the amphitheater next door, to see this show, The Chemistry of Light. Uh, it was a very impressive show with a, a lot of uh, explosions and so on. So tonight we're going to do maybe a bit less explosions, but we're going to talk about the physics, the physics of light. Now, light is everywhere around us, and if I switch off the lights here, and probably the screens here, You can see that you would have a very different experience tonight. Uh, so our eyes are adapted to, and essentially they use the light that's all around us to essentially interact with our environment. Now, if you don't have light, you get a completely different experience. A bit like a karaoke party without sound. <laughs> okay, let's get the light back on. Uh, all right. So light is also around us. Sorry, I should give you a bit more light than that. Uh, okay. Light is also around us as a source of energy. The sunlight that we have uh, is our primary source of, of energy, at least for the Earth, for the energy balance of the Earth. Uh, the sunlight also powers photosynthesis. So essentially, it gives us our oxygen. Without light, no oxygen, and we wouldn't be here. But more recently, uh, our Mastering of some of the technological aspect of light has also brought a lot of new applications, and it's everywhere in our everyday life, even if we don't think about it. And one of these is lasers. I've got one here. I'm using a laser here, a laser pointer. Okay. Now, lasers were invented 50 years ago only, and they are really a product of quantum mechanics. So you know, without quantum mechanics, there's no lasers. Uh, and they have some very specific properties. We don't often think about it, but uh, a laser, first it has a very well-defined color, I'll talk about it later, but it also has a very well-defined direction. So essentially all the light emitted by a laser goes in a straight line in a very, very small spot, uh, like you can see it here. Um, these two properties allow us to use light in ways that we never thought about before. So either write microscopic things at the, web, at the net scale of the wavelength of light, a few micrometers, like, for example, you do in a, a DVD or Blu-ray players, like you all, all have one at home. So this laser here is probably very similar to the DVD, the laser you have in your, D, your DVD players. Um, and it also powers the internet. You know, <laughs> all the long distance communications on the internet are powered by laser, by infrared lasers that transmit the information. 
Um, some of you might have noticed that it was also part of our <laughs> recent flag debate uh, in New Zealand. I don't know why this one didn't make the 40, but, uh, uh, or the 4 for that matter. So maybe we can start a, a campaign to add a 6th flag. Um, all right. <laughs> Now, what we're interested in light is not so much uh, the image, like what we can see with our eyes, but it's more the spectrum, the spectral content of light. So, in particular, the color. So, which colors does light contain? So, I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about electromagnetic waves because that's what light is, and I'm going to talk about photons. Now, in physics, it's two different, two equivalent uh, description of light. So, the photons are bits of lights. Uh, and essentially they can have a given energy. And the energy of these photons, of these bits of light, uh, correspond to the color that we see with our eyes. This is an example, I don't know whether you can see the double rainbow here. Um, uh, this is one photo I took um, maybe six, seven years ago in Waikana. You don't often see double rainbow, but in New Zealand I think I've seen two or three since I've been here in ten years, so we're quite lucky with that. Um, I talked about the internet. When you prepare those talks, now the internet is a great resource. You find all sorts of things, uh, pictures, uh, videos, and so on. Uh, I was looking for a picture of a double rainbow, and uh, I couldn't find any good ones. And the reason is that most of the search I was ending up on this guy here, which had a video uh, of a double rainbow that made 50 million views. And it's all about how amazed he is to see a double rainbow for the first time. Now, he was so popular that Microsoft uh, hired him to make an advertisement uh, for Windows Live. And you can see here how they photoshopped the double rainbow inside here. <laughs> if you're careful, the, double, the second rainbow should be much weaker, and it's, invert, it's inverted. So the red light here is inside, and the violet light is outside. <laughs> so that's, there's quite a few of those on the internet. Most double rainbows are the wrong way around. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right, so the way, the reason we see those rainbows is that the droplets of water manage to take the white light emitted from the sun and split it. So it bends the light and it bends it ever so slightly differently for the different colors or the different energy of the photons. Um, in the lab, when we do spectroscopy, typically we would use something like a prism, like that. Uh, which also bends the light uh, differently. Or more recently, we use something that, like these glasses. So we don't use these glasses, but these glasses here have a grating, and it's a very fine uh, pattern of line. And when you put this, you actually see rainbows uh, everywhere. You can see them. Like you don't see. I have a few of those uh, out there uh, if you want to try it uh, during the drinks. Um, now, those are great. I mean, we use them in physics. Uh, they were developed by, uh, by our uh, teacher for first year uh, as, well, first for our first year student, but also for outreach. And these are really also for outreach. And I've used them a few times. That's how it looks like if you were to look at the pattern here um, of those uh, ratings. Uh, and if you go to schools, you can give it to students, to pupils. Uh, here in Iowa School, I've been perhaps every twice, twice a term, basically, I go there and I bring some demonstrations from our pool of demonstration in first year. Uh, and the kids get a chance to try things, explore, have fun, and try to you know, ask question experiments. And I think even if they are very young, I mean, these kids are kind of five years old, they will always take something from it. And they always also think of experiments that you didn't think about. They are quite, uh, quite awesome at that age. I shouldn't say that there are many students in the room. <laughs> and so that's what you see with those lights. If you look at uh, different bulbs, you can see how the light here, so you see it through your glasses, it's, you see several lines. So there's a bit of red, yellow, and that's how a compact fluorescent bulb like we have up here uh, these fluorescent bulbs, that's how they make white light, by mixing uh, lines of various colors. If you look at an incandescent light, you can see it's more like a continuum. There's a bit of every, everything in the spectrum. The red light has only red, because it absorbed, it absorbed all, the blue, all the blue light emitted by the incandescent uh, filament is absorbed, and therefore what we see is what we get is the red that comes out. Uh, we also have these awesome lamps 
there are gas lamps, uh, plasma lamps, where you have various gases. You can't see here hydrogen, helium, and so on. And you see the lines here, uh, the emission, atomic emission lines of those, of those, uh, of those gases. And essentially, this, you know, we can tell the kids, when you look at the stars that are far away, we don't know what, we shouldn't know what they are made of, we can never get there. But by looking at the light that they emit, it tells us how much hydrogen, how much helium these stars are, are made of. And everything we know about the universe is really thanks to the light that we receive uh, uh, on Earth. Right. Um, Oh, these are some examples. I was telling you, you know, these five years old are quite amazing. This, I went there for a little demonstration. I explained them what I've just shown you. And one month later, after the school holiday, the teacher asked them to write something about it. And you had all, and I had a pack of 25 drawings. And all those drawings were showing things that were really quite close to reality. Uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, these kids do pick uh, things. Uh, they will get something from your, from your presentations. Um, and partly it's because they don't have enough science at school. You know, the teachers spend a lot of time on writing, counting, but if you can get just one bit of science here and there, I think it can make such a, a big difference. Okay, here I've got a spectrometer, which is more of the type that we use uh, in the lab. And essentially, the light, oops, sorry, the light gets in through that hole, we have white light, mirrors. This is a grating. Essentially, this is the same as is on those, uh, on those uh, glasses. It spreads the light. And here we have a detector. And it's essentially the same as on your digital camera in your mobile phone and so on. So this detector just counts how many photons get there. And if we count how many are there, how many are there, how many are there, we get a spectrum of each photon of, we, of each light. So, this is an example of the spectrum that you would get from, uh, from white light, an incandescent white light, like I showed earlier. Uh, there's a lot of emission basically in the red, yellow, and, uh, and blue, and that's what makes the white light that we see. Okay, now, what we do with those spect spectrometers, uh, I'm going to talk about some types of spectroscopy that really rely on the lasers. Okay? So the laser has this ability to you know, pack all those power in a very small area. I should say in passing, you know, these lasers are not toys. You, know, they, you can buy them everywhere on training and so on, but they are dangerous. This probably one milliwatt laser, it's about 10,000 times less powerful than your normal light bulbs, uh, but it packs everything into one millimeter squared. Okay? Whereas your light bulbs, if you're one meter away, it will be packed in something that would be probably as big as that screen. So essentially, if you get this laser in the eye, uh, you'll get as much, essentially as much light in your eye as if you were sticking your, light, your eye right on the light bulb. You would probably burn yourself before, but that's uh, the amount of light that you can get. So you can, it, these are really dangerous. Um, and then you get people shining them at planes and so on, but uh, that's another story. Right, laser spectroscopy. That's where the tonic water comes, from, uh, comes, uh, comes in. A um, couple of weeks ago, I was talking with one of my colleagues, John Lechner, here, about uh, this inaugural, and uh, uh, he said, what? You're not planning to do any experiments? <laughs> so, uh, but, I mean, no, I was not planning to do experiments. But then I thought about it, and I said, if John, I mean, he's a hardened theorist in our department. <laughs> if even John says that I should do experiments, I should probably do experiments. So I do have here the tonic water, and I'm going to try and show you what, how you can see fluorescence from uh, tonic water. So this is the water. This is to protect so that the laser doesn't go all over the place. As I said, it's a bit dangerous. Uh, I'm this off. Okay, if I shine a red laser in this, it will probably go through and you won't see anything. So you don't even see the laser. Um, now, if I shine a blue laser, so if you look over there, this, um, maybe here, watch, here, if you, this is violet, uh, four or five nanometers. This is the same lasers as you have in your Blu ray, uh, your Blu ray um, players. Um, this wavelength is strongly absorbed by uh, the quinine. So here you can see that 
this tonic water contains this molecule here, the uh, co-quinine. Uh, actually, this absorbs strongly UV, but uh, here it's close enough to the UV to, to be absorbed. Now, if I shine it through the bottle, what you should be able to see is not the laser, but the emission uh, from the, uh, the fluorescence emission. Okay? So, here you don't see anything because the photons go through the bottle and they never get to your eye. Here they get absorbed and they get re-emitted in all directions uh, uh, and hence they, they reach your eye. Now we can take a spectrum of those uh, if I manage to change the setup here. Um, all right. Oh, like that. Okay. So here we have the spectrum. So that's the spectrometer. Uh, I can have a look at the spectrum now. What you probably going to happen is that if I open this, we're going to see essentially the spectrum from those fluorescent lights. So I told you earlier, those white lights, they look white because they have a number of lines at all wavelengths. These are the lights that are in those fluorescent, uh, fluorescent lights. Uh, so I need to uh, remove uh, at least this at the back, remove the lights, and hopefully I can take a spectrum now of this. If this is going to be enough. Okay, try not to. So you see two things here. One small, very narrow peak, that's the laser. I told you lasers have a very, very pure color. So it's only one, really one very narrow wavelength range. And the other thing is the emission, the blue emission from the, from the, uh, the queen. Okay. You can see it's interesting. If I do this, I actually see the emission from the from the monitors. Actually, when we were when we were trying this yesterday, we saw that and we said, "Wow, what's this?" It's, it was quite uh, quite interesting. And uh, I'll show you uh, if I manage to get the display back. Yeah. So here you have a spectrum of the queen that I acquired with the laser and uh, and the uh, blue emission. Now, if I point this here, what you see is that, again, two features. Broad feature and a very sharp line in the blue at about, do you see it here? At about 450. You see it here at about 450 nanometers. Now, that's how these projectors work, basically. They use fluorescence. They have a blue laser in there. That gives you the blue uh, in the white light here. And then they have uh, fluorescence emitters that can give you red, a green, and so on. And then they use filters depending on which color you want. So for example, if I manage, I've got too many buttons here. If I, if I do red, uh, I should switch off the more lights again. Uh, if I do red, what you see, this is the red emission, where you see still a tiny bit of the laser, because the laser is creating the fluorescence. But here you see the fluorescence that's cut by a filter. There's a sharp cut around 600. That looks red. Now, if I do green, that's how it looks. And if I do blue, our eyes can't see that it's a pure blue, but it's actually a very pure blue, this one. It's the blue directly from the laser. Uh, now, you can do any colors by mixing. You know, for example, pink is a bit of blue and a bit of red. And with this, it's, uh, it's, again, it's quite uh, remarkable that our eyes can't see the, the fact that the blue is so pure and the red is not. Um, all right. Now, these are a number of uh, minerals, actually. So fluorescence is very common. Many, many materials absorb light, especially in the UV, and will re-emit it in the visible. So these, all these minerals have uh, different colors. Um, it's great. It's very powerful. It's very uh, strong. Um, it's used in many applications. The biologists use them to understand how cells work and so on. Uh, but one of the things you can see is that when you see two um, uh, green, for example, minerals here, the color itself is not enough to tell you what you're looking at. So essentially, there's not a very good specificity. It doesn't tell you the chemical, comp uh, the chemical composition of your, of your materials. So that's why, and I should have changed that, but I'll go back to this. Yeah. That's why basically the type of spectroscopy we, we, we study is a type of spectroscopy that can actually, again, use lasers, we point it at those materials, and the spectrum will be a very definite characteristic of what uh, material you're looking at. So I'll show you uh, how this comes about. So 
one of the problems with the fluorescence basically is it's associated with the uh, absorption of light by electrons. So the electrons are excited and these electrons are not very um, specific. But molecules typically are composed of many atoms <coughs> and uh, these atoms can be excited and undergo some sort of vibrations. Um, now, this is a bit like when you play guitar um, or piano, you plug a string or hit a, a chord and you have a very well defined uh, frequency, resonance frequency, and that gives you a sound. If you do a different string, it's got different tension, different thickness and so on, you get a different resonance frequency. It's the same for molecules, so if I plug the molecule, there would be, if I plug it in some ways, I can get this vibration and I can also get a different type of vibration. So this is more like a breathing of the entire molecule. Here is like a stretching of those hydrogens at the end. Now this one is supposed to be about three times as fast as that one. Okay? That's just uh, uh, how those molecules, the forces between the atoms. That's the resonance frequency. Um, now in quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics tells us is that in the nano world, uh, a frequency like that is associated with a well-defined energy. So this vibration here is three times more energetic than this vibration. Now if we had a way of probing the energy of those vibrations, it would tell us almost everything we want to know about the molecule, the chemical composition of the molecule. So we could send photons to that uh, so light, but the energy is much, much smaller than the visible light. So you can send infrared photons, and there's a whole branch called infrared spectroscopy that works very well and is also used a lot. But what we do is we use a technique that was um, developed or discovered by this, this guy, an Indian physicist, uh, Raman, and the technique, uh, uh, sorry, the technique uh, now has his name, so it's Raman spectroscopy. Uh, and what Raman discovered is that you could actually send photons in the visible light that's much more energetic than the, than the photons of the, the, the vibrations of the molecules. And if you manage to make them interact with the molecule, they will actually excite this vibration and come out with a bit less energy as you send them in. So I have a cartoon that illustrates this here, where you have this vibration as a uh, bit of a spring, the photon is up here, and if you send a ball like that, you can excite the molecule here, or the vibration, and because in physics we always conserve energy, your photon must come out with less energy than you sent it in. So if you send, for example, a green photon, you might get something that's more yellowish, uh, and if you calculate how much energy you've lost, <coughs> you know how much energy this vibration has. And a typical molecule will have many vibrations, so you send photons, one at a time, well not one at a time, actually we send a laser, a lot of photons, uh, and we build up an idea of where the energies of those vibrations are. Um, what this thing doesn't convey very well is that this technique is very weak, so basically for every uh, 10, 100 billion photons we send, only one of them will actually uh, excite the vibrations of the molecule. So it's a very, very weak, weak effect. Uh, but if you have enough of your substance, enough of those vibrations, you can still get a very nice spectra. And those spectra, for example, give you everything you need to know about the chemical composition of your substance. So here I've got uh, an example of a white powder, two different spectra. This is paracetamol, that's the molecule I was showing you before. The big peak here is the bracing mode, the vibrations, excitation of this mode, and there are a lot of other vibration non energy. Down here it's cocaine. Okay? If you measure the two, well, we didn't measure this one. <laughs> Only the psychologists have cocaine in the, <laughs> the psychologist in the university. Uh, so basically you can actually tell what it what, what is what. Okay? Um, now this uh, brings me, so basically the Raman spectroscopy gives us a direct <coughs> fingerprint of what we're looking at. Uh, it's non-invasive, you can choose more or less which laser you want, as if you just choose something that's you know, non -ab non -ab not absorbed by your material. You can do it from a distance. It's got a high spatial resolution because it uses lasers, uh, but as I said, it's a very, very weak effect. So that's why essentially all the research we do here is trying to make this effect much stronger so that we can look at smaller quantities 
just for example one uh, yeah, ultimately one molecule of that. Um, okay, so I could do an experiment with this and show you Rama. It would be quite hard. It's a weak effect, so it's very fiddly. You have to remove any other source of light and so on. So that's why I'm not doing it. Uh, in the lab, we have essentially the same as this, just bigger boxes, uh, better detector, and uh, several lasers, and we can take Raman spectra using a microscope and so on. That's the sort of uh, our daily uh, business. Um, now, I give a few examples of things that we've done, uh, or applications of Raman spectroscopy. Uh, this was a, a manuscript uh, from the Turnbull Library, and these guys were interested to know whether anything was added to it after it was uh, originally written. So you can have a look at it, put a laser, not too strong, you don't want to burn a hole uh, through it. Uh, and you look at the spectrum and you can say, oh, this is all pigment, or this is this pigment, this pigment. Some of those pigments would, would, did not exist or were not known at the time where the manuscript was originally written. So it tells us that someone actually added bits and pieces to it. And you can map it and it tells you a, a bit of the history of that. So that's Raman spectroscopy is used a lot in like art and archaeology for this sort of applications. Um, you might have seen recently uh, this in the it was in the news in the, on, B, on the BBC for example. Uh, some scientists develop a way of using Raman spectroscopy to see in real time whether cells in the brain are cancerous or not. So essentially uh, you have a system here similar to ours. It's designed such that it's actually portable and it's built in the scalpel. I'm gonna, if you don't like images of brain, look away now. Uh, that's how the surgeon does during the operation. And basically, he can look at his screen and say, oh, that's cancerous, I take it off. That's not, I keep it. And you can imagine that's quite important when you operate on the brain. You want to keep as much of your brain as you, as you can. Ironically, it was the first patient for this technique was in London, and it was um, a, PhD, a physics PhD student from Imperial uh, College. So this technique works well, but as I said, it's quite a weak effect. Now, I've got a couple more of background to discuss how we try to enhance that effect. I'm going to talk about nanoparticles and ice scattering, but I need, I need a drink first. So, nanoparticles. So, one way to, well, what we use, as uh, the Vice Chancellor said, is silver and gold nanoparticles, and we want to use them to boost the sensitivity of this Raman effect. Um, and nowadays, uh, especially over the last 10, 20 years, people have become very good at making those nanoparticles. Here I've got examples from uh, uh, collaborators in Spain here. They are making these beautifully uniform and well-defined nanoparticles of gold and silver. We also have very nice electron microscopy technique that allows <coughs> us to characterize them and image them. Um, so anything, if you can name it, basically it exists in a nanoparticle. You can make any shape. Nano rods, nano triangles, nano stars, nano, nano whatever. Um, now, you're probably familiar with the optical properties of metals. You know they exist in our everyday life. We use metals because they are good reflectors. They reflect light from every direction. Uh, with a very high accuracy. We see that every day in the Earth. Now, at the nanoscale, the optical properties can be quite different. And here I have a number of uh, gold nanoparticles of different sizes, different shapes. And what you can see is their characteristic colors. Now, if you have something like a blue one here, that like would be like the nano triangles I showed earlier, uh, this thing is blue because it interacts strongly with the red. It absorbs all the red, so what we're left is just blue, what we, we see there. Now, this is good because we want, our, uh, we want to exploit those to interact with our, for example, red laser and get, you know, use them as some sort of lenses. And here, oops, I saw on the wrong one. Here I've got examples of calculation of the flow of energy around those nanoparticles. Here it's just a sphere. But if you manage to hit the resonance where those particles are, are strongly excited, are strongly absorb the light, you can see that the flow of electromagnetic energy, essentially light energy, is really 
attracted towards here the surface of the nanoparticle. So the idea of the technique we're, we're trying to study is to use those nanoparticles, excite them at resonance, and then you put molecules there where they will feel a much larger electric field. So it's a bit like uh, using a lens, uh, but really at the nanoscale, when conventional lenses can't work at the nanoscale. Um, now, if we want to understand this, uh, these sort of problems, this is not new. Uh, the, <coughs> how particles affect light has been studied for quite a while. Um, and it's the general area of light scattering, and I'm going to give a few words about this. Um, the general problem of light scattering is you take an arbitrary shaped object, and uh, we like taking a kiwi because it's got no obvious symmetries here. Uh, you send an, in, an, an incident wave, for example this red laser, uh, through the kiwi, and you look at what's uh, transmitted on the other side. Or you would like to know how much light is transmitted on the other side. Now the scattering problem is a bit more complicated than this. Um, you can actually, if it's, you see less light transmitted, it means that some of it was absorbed by the kiwi and that makes it hotter. Um, or some of this was redirected and scattered away from the kiwi. Okay? So we have all these processes occurring at the same time and the light scattering, uh, the study of light scattering is really trying to understand how you can shape all this, get more absorption, less absorption, more transmission, less transmission and so on. Now these are very important in many, many fields. Uh, here, if you look at the light that's sent exactly back from the, from the, from the lab where the photon came from, uh, what's called backscattered wave, uh, these guys in the military are very interested in getting as little as possible light sent back uh, to the radar. So if you have a radar and you send nothing back to the radar, the radar doesn't see you. You can evade the radar. So. Uh, on the opposite, anything to do with lightings on roads or bikes, you want to get as much light as possible back so that you get uh, something that all the light comes back and this looks very bright when it's illuminated because all the light you send comes back to you. Um, in astrophysics, this transmitted wave is very important because everything we receive from, uh, from, the, from space uh, is light and it has to go through some intergalactic dust like this uh, that can be quite problematic because if it dims the image we see, it appears further away than it is. So you can get uh, uh, wrong uh, interpretation. So it's very important for the astrophysicist to know how much light is scattered, is uh, transmitted through that dust. Uh, and climate modeling is the other very important bit. And climate modeling includes a bit of everything here because the light that's coming is absorbed and therefore it adds up to the energy balance of the of the um, of the Earth, uh, it can be transmitted back. So some of the light that's emitted by the Earth in the form of heat can be transmitted back, or can be reflected back. Now, if you absorb more than you let go, you have the greenhouse effect, and you have uh, global warming. So these aerosol particles, which are small particles, a bit like the kiwi, um, they are emitted by power plants and all sorts of things, and they play a very important role in the energy balance of the Earth. If you want to understand them, you need to understand how light is emitted, scattered, uh, absorbed by those, by those particles. So it's a very important problem. Um, and you might have seen in my title slide smog, that's where it comes in. Uh, this is the dragon of the Hobbit. You know we have uh, uh, next door here in Wellington one of the best uh, team in terms of visual effects at Weta Digital. Uh, they work on many movies, including The Hobbit. And what they're trying to do there is to essentially reproduce reality as closely as possible when they make uh, render scenes. And for that, they need to know exactly how much light is scattered around by this, uh, the objects that they do. So they do a lot of light scattering. And they don't want to render something that looks like that, because that doesn't look very, very realistic, at least as far as a dragon is concerned, I think. Uh, and very recently we've been talking to them about trying to get a better understanding of light scattered by fire. Uh, and you can, this is a very complicated business, fire. Not only it absorbs, scatters, transmits, but it actually <coughs> emits light and there's a, all sort of, uh, of phys interesting physics going on inside the flame. Okay, so that takes me to the final two minutes here of my talk. And that's where I'm going to try to give you a brief 
uh, insight into actual research project that we're doing along this um, uh, in this in this in this context. Um, so, taking the vice chancellor's class. <laughs> All right. So, I should say. Um, as a kid, I've always loved. There were two things I was, well, a, a lot of things, but in the context of tonight, uh, it was mathematics and computers actually that uh, uh, were my, my passion, I should say. Now, when I got to university, I decided to take physics. I thought mathematics might be a bit too abstract, and computers, if you really like them and you work in computers, you'll spend all your life. You will never have friends and so on. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to choose physics, and I don't regret it, because physics, you get the fun of experiments. You can, do, um, uh, you can work in the lab, build stuff, but you can also do theory. And I must admit that I'm often attracted towards this theoretical side because of those, uh, this, this uh, childhood of uh, mathematics. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about the theory. Uh, that's part of our research. Um, and essentially, all this theory is about light scattering. So we want to understand how light is scattered by those particles. And if we want to do that, we have to solve Maxwell's equations, which are given here. They are not very complicated equations. They relate the, electromag the electric and magnetic field. And therefore, they tell us anything about electromagnetic waves. Uh, so that's light and actually a lot uh, a lot more uh, things. Um, now, solving those in vacuum is not very difficult. We do that uh, in, uh, in uh, first year, or maybe not first year, but in undergrad physics. Uh, as soon as you add an object, like the kiwi or anything, it gets a lot more complicated. Uh, and actually, we can do spheres. Uh, these are just examples of calculations we can do with spheres since, this, uh, since about 100 years. But anything else, we are really stuck. We can't really do it, uh, at least using analytical theories. So we're left with using computers. Uh, we can always throw something like that, a mesh. We discretize our, our particle in very small thing to a computer and ask it to solve the equations numerically. Uh, you get results, but there's a number of things. For this, this is state of the art electromagnetic calculation. It took about 15 minutes to run on a reasonable uh, PC. And you can see it's not that great. I mean, we get a result, but it's still a bit patchy in places. And in practice, we don't want one result like that. We want actually the results for all particle orientations, because we rarely work with particles with well-defined orientation. We want all wavelengths, because we want a spectrum. So it doesn't take 15 minutes, but it takes a day, a week, to get the results. Now, if you look at aerosols in climate change, you don't have only one type of particle. You have different sizes, different shapes. So you end up, your calculation will take a year on a piece. So all this to tell you that there's still a lot of interest in getting better methods by making those calculations uh, using Maxwell's, uh, using essentially uh, mathematical tools to solve those equations better. And we've been working on those, especially in the context of nanoparticles. So we've taken this, uh, this thing here. So this is the website, a, a, a website on the NASA, NASA website. And that's a place where you can find this uh, T-matrix method codes. And essentially, it's used by a lot of climate scientists, uh, astrophysicists, to calculate the optical properties of their, uh, of their particles. Uh, these codes are great because they are very fast. Uh, you can download them from free. This is the guy who invented, uh, invented this method. He died recently. Um, and, but they have one problem, is that they don't work all the time. They don't work for particles that are too elongated. They don't work for, for example, our nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles, it didn't work very well. So we, over the last five, seven years, we decided to try and say, OK, we're going to try to apply this method and work out what are the problems that face this method for our particles. Can we find solutions to solve those problems and, uh, and uh, you know, essentially make this method better? Um, so I'm not going to go. I can see my students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go in the details of this. It's quite mathematical, but the mathematics is just the language. You know, it doesn't. In the end, what we did is just problem solving. And there's one thing that I like to talk about is how 
the problem solving in theoretical physics has changed a lot over the last 20 years, I guess, with computers. Because now most people, most researchers will be very computer literate. They will always be able to write a program to check something and so on. And that's changed a lot of things. There's two things I want to say. One is symbolic computations. That's something that, at least when I was a student, I didn't know about. Essentially, you have software that can do all the computation you want for you. And it doesn't have to be numbers. It can be letters and things like you do in high school. It will do it for you. This is something that you might remember from high school. Uh, you press it, it does it. It does things that are much more involved, uh, that we need, uh, like integrals, uh, differentiation. It does it for you. And if you were to do it yourself, it would take, you know, we could do it ourselves, but it might take 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. Sometimes it would take an hour, a day to do a calculation. Here you just type it in, it does it, and it gets the right results. Whereas if you actually spend one hour on a calculation, there's no guarantee. And if you make it more complicated, it does it. It doesn't care. It does it. So it, this, this really changes the way you think about things. Because if you've got an idea, you can test it. Um, now, the, the second thing is that uh, now, at least the way I like to work is by doing this, what I call numerical experiments. So we have a problem. We need to solve the problem. And the first thing we do is use the computer to understand better the problem. So I've got a little numerical experiment here, which is not the T-matrix, but something that's more relevant to you, probably. Uh, if you write numbers from 1 to 1,000, how many zeros would you have? And uh, we're going to have a little show of hands to see. <laughs> so who thinks it's less than 200? If you 200 to 300. 300 to 400? More than 400? Uh, we get even less participation than uh, <laughs> on a mayoral election here. <laughs> but uh, well, the answer is this, 192. So this problem, actually, I got it from, uh, from my son, who is uh, year 9. No, he's not year 9. He's 9, and he's in year 4. And that's what they do for problem solving. And I think it's a really nice little problem because it's simple to understand, but a lot of ways of approaching it. And here I know you didn't have enough time to, uh, to, to do it. Now, there's various ways of approaching it. So these are the sort of problems that, that we face. You know, I mean, not different language, but it's the sort of problem we have to solve. First one is brute force. You write them all and you count them. Okay? You get 192 if you get it right. If you have to do it from 1 to 10,000, it's getting problematic. But uh, that's, that still works, and that can help you understand the problem. Solution two, that what people would have done maybe 20, 50 years ago, you think. Okay? So between 1 and 9, I've got none of them. Between 10 and 99, I'm going to have 9. 10, 20, 30, and so on. Between 100 and 109, I've got 11, and so on. And you add up everything. Don't forget the 1,000, and you get the 192. Fine, that's great. Now, we could do that, but nowadays what we do is we actually first write a program to check what the answer is. Because if you know the answer, it's quite easier, it's much easier to find how to find the answer if you know that. So, it's easy to write the program, choose your language, this is like that, and it outputs the number of zeros. Okay? Now, the good thing about this sort of approach is that not only it tells us how the, what the answer is, so it helps us, you know, if we have an idea of how it works, it's a good check. But we can actually investigate more parameters of the problem. Look, we can look at the other numbers, number of ones, two, three. And we start seeing some patterns and things with zeros and so on. And I won't go much further into details, but basically, once you know this, you can find a better way of getting to the solution. And you can actually find a better way of getting to the solution for any, from one to one million, for example. Actually, I tried to run one to one million on the computer, and it took an hour. So at some point, you do have to think, and you have to use the computer cleverly, just for small things, and it just changes the way I think we do theoretical physics. And I think that's why probably there can be a lot of new discoveries of things that had been looked at 50 years ago, uh, but now we have better tools to look at those. So we did these sort of things. We went back to the guy in short here, and uh, we had a look at those codes, find a lot, uh, uh, we identified the problems, find ways of solving them, and after about five years of working on this, we, we have codes now that work really well, 
they work on those elongated nanoparticles and we're going to publish them before the end of the year so that everybody can use them um, uh, in the various all the other contexts. Okay, that gives leads me to the last section and that's more the experimental part of my research of our research I should say um, uh, and that's about using those nanoparticles that we've seen our understanding of the light scattering by those nanoparticles and our expertise in Raman spectroscopy we combine all this together to make Raman spectroscopy better and ideally to the point where you can actually measure just one, one of those molecules so these are the sort of nanoparticles that we work with either well-defined particles like that, that you can essentially almost write uh, using electron, electron beams on the substrate, or more less defined particles like these aggregates here of spheres. What we're looking for is places like this where the electric field is very large. So essentially, your laser here would be felt much stronger than anywhere else. You have very large enhancement at the tip or at the gaps. Um, so that's how an experiment would look like if you could zoom in. We have those molecules that are here. We manage, we put them on the, on the nanoparticles. We send a laser, we look at the emitted light, we observe a Raman spectrum. And these are uh, silver codecs. Now, a lot of our work has been, I mean, it's a very messy system. You know, you have particles of various sizes. We don't always know what the exact sizes are. They can aggregate, not aggregate. If you move those by a nanometer, you get completely different results in the enhancement. The molecules may be there, they may adsorb, they may not adsorb, depending on which type of molecules you have. So it's a fairly complex system. And a lot of our work has been about trying to understand, find ways of studying this system and making sure, OK, we can, under those conditions, actually get a spectrum like this and say, that's from one molecule. Um, and that's what we did, and basically here is an example. This is a, just a spectrum that we know using various techniques comes from just one molecule. Uh, and this is the same spectrum for the same molecules, but not uh, in those colors. I should say I have SIRS here, Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy. That's the <coughs> name of the technique uh, that when you use those nanoparticles. So here, we have to integrate for much longer, 400 seconds. We get a small peak for one million molecule. Here, fraction of a second, big peak, just one molecule. If you do the math, there's about 10 billion times more emission from that single molecule as the normal ones. So potentially, we can get huge enhancement with, with this, um, this method. This 10 billion is big. I mean, it's as if we use a one milliwatt laser like this to do those experiments, and we get as much signal as if we were using a 10 megawatt laser. So it's quite uh, a saving in, uh, in the university power bill. <laughs> uh, so what do we do with this? Now we know we can detect those uh, single molecules where well, there's a lot of physics that's when you look at many molecules it doesn't tell you the whole story. Uh, for example if you look at uh, it, even the Raman spectrum for one molecule it's much narrower than for many molecules because all those molecules have tiny shifts depending on where they are. So those you studying those shifts tells us about the interaction of the molecules with uh, this environment. More recently, we've been thinking about ways of how can we actually get this in some sort of analytical way. I mean, for analytical chemistry, one thing that I'm not saying here is that in order to see one molecule, we actually put molecules everywhere. And we just have ways of making sure that we only see the one here. Because all the other ones are not enhanced, and we don't see them. But it's not ideal. There's a lot of waste in those, in those uh, experiments. What we want to do is get all the molecules here in the places where they are most enhanced. Um, and we've been trying to do this, for example, using systems like that, where you have now particles that are naturally capped on the side, but exposed here at the tip. So if you manage to get molecules mixed with there, they only go at the tip where you can see them. So you can really get into a situation where you have one drop of molecule, whatever, in this glass, you add your nanoparticle, put in your scattering volume, if you wait long enough, you will see it and see a spectrum and be able to identify it. So this is the first step in that direction. Um, final example, just to show how powerful the technique can be. Uh, this molecule here has got this vibration here between a carbon and a nitrogen. Now we know that every 100 atoms of carbon 
will be a carbon-13. So there's an isotope substitution that's used for carbon dated and so on. So it's a natural one in every 100, one, for one person, sorry, in every one, every 100 carbon atom in your body, it would be a carbon-13. Now, because it changes the mass, it changes the frequency of vibration, and therefore it changes the position of the peak. So we can detect this sort of uh, substitution. But in practice, no, we can't detect them because if you look at an average spectrum like down here, what you see is only the main peak because the 1% here is completely overwhelmed. If you look hard enough at the single molecule level, you will actually see in 1% of cases events where you have a carbon-13 in that molecule. So essentially, this shows that our this uh, technique, single molecule detection, can actually change, detect a change of just one mass unit from carbon-12 to carbon-13 on one atom of one molecule. So that's how powerful it is, and that's really what we're trying to do, is to find ways of exploiting it, because uh, it's not always as simple as it looks in the talks. <laughs> <laughs> Ask uh, my students, <laughs> they will tell you. All right. So, as you can see, I've run out of colors of the rainbow for my bubbles here, so I'm almost finished. Uh, if you looked carefully here, they, I've almost talked about everything, except <laughs> perhaps the balloons here. Now, I, when I, that's, that's something that's nice. I mean, I talked about uh, my students and postdoc at the beginning. It's a really nice environment to work with. Uh, you always, you know, smart young people, you learn, you teach them a lot, but you actually learn a lot from them, especially in IT and this sort of thing. And it's also of an environment to work, to work with. So when I turned up this morning, that was my office. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent, I spent the whole day working, preparing that talk with every 15 minutes, bam! <laughs> and people laughing next door. So that, that, was a, that was an interesting part. Now, I will, that gave me an idea. I will try to finish this talk with a bang. And I have an endless supply of red balloons. <laughs> and I'm going to try to see whether I can blow up a balloon with a laser. So I told you these things were dangerous. And uh, you know, you don't want this to get into your eye. I mean, directly into your eye. So let's see whether it worked earlier. I should, you should never. <laughs> you made quite a mess back here, actually. <laughs> See, we've got glasses and plastic and all sorts of things. Um, I'm going to start with an apology, actually. I've, I've lectured in here many times over the years, and I've never, until tonight, realised how uncomfortable the seats are. So I'm not going to hold you up much longer. Um, it, it, it's my honour to um, give the vote of fact, thanks. Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, my name is Professor David Harper. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science. And as I said, I have the privilege and the pleasure of giving the vote of thanks to Professor Eric LaRue tonight. Um, the Professor's inaugural lecture has become an important um, part of our traditions at Victoria University um, and recognises the success of people like Eric who have been promoted into the Professor ranks. Um, last year he was promoted into Professor and this was a personal achievement for him that also reflected the significant achievements that we've seen across Victoria University over recent years. Importantly, Eric's both a contributor and I think a leader of that wider institutional success. Um, as Professor Guilford mentioned in his introduction, the work that Eric and his colleagues have been involved in highlights this university's commitment to understanding and tackling issues of global significance and engaging in fundamental cutting edge research that contributes to New Zealand's design-led high manufacture um, manufacturing economy. Um, the topic of tonight's talk is very timely, as Eric mentioned himself, given that 2015 is the International Year of, the light, of light and Light-Based Technologies. It's a global initiative by the United Nations to raise awareness of how these kinds of technologies can provide solutions to worldwide challenges in areas as diverse as energy and health. And tonight, Eric has given us a really good some really good examples of how that can be achieved. 
Um, so we learned tonight that the way light is scattered by an object reveals a wealth of information, and that by shining lasers into objects, maybe balloons as well, the scattered light can provide a unique chemical fingerprint, uh, which can be used to identify many different types of molecules. To be honest, before tonight, I, I, I've, I was never clear why physicists were that interested in lasers. Um, gold particles, I can understand. Lasers seem to be old technology, and I was pleased that Eric actually started by showing DVD players and so forth. Laser pointers, uh, maybe energy weapons in Star Wars, but that's, the uses beyond that, I think, have eluded many of us. Um, turns out that Eric is a world leader in Raman spectroscopy, and it's a laser-based technique, as you discovered tonight, um, that can be used across a diversity of areas, including food analysis, forensically for detecting traces of explosives or drugs, for detecting cancerous cells or tumours, and by using metallic nanoparticles to boost that signal, something that Eric has, has been involved in very much and at the forefront of, to detect even the very smallest quantities down to one or two molecules of a substance. Um, I'm probably misquoting him, but I, he said something along the lines of it's the ultimate analytical tool, it's very powerful, and I agree. Um, I don't think you can overemphasize how important the work of Eric and his colleagues is. Many of our major developments in science I'm seeing happening these days because people are working at the, the cutting edge of their own discipline, but then they're transporting that, that knowledge into other areas. Um, and that's where those really exciting things are happening. So the sorts of technology Eric is working with transported into other areas is where we're seeing some really interesting and important things happening. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that into the future as this technology becomes more and more refined. Um, as a scientist myself, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibilities for the future. And I think a hallmark of a, a great scientist is one who's, who can not only conduct that sort of cutting edge fundamental research, um, that has applicability outside the, outside the laboratory, um, something that Eric is clearly able to do, but also who can advance our theoretical understanding of a topic. So it was nice to see Eric getting on to what some of his really interesting theoretical work, um, and I think you touched on how that sort of understanding can even be applied to something outside of what you would normally think of, say, the realm of looking at um, understanding climate modelling uh, using some of the uh, mathematics or physics behind things. Um, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago and Eric came up to me afterwards and it was, I was dealing with animal learning and all sorts of things entirely different from this. And the thing that Eric wanted to talk to me about was the physics underlying the, the bubbles that uh, dolphins were blowing. So he's a real f physicist in that sense um, and sees things as, as problems to be solved. Now, this was touched on a bit at the beginning, but I think it's worth mentioning again because it really is impressive. Across his impressive career, and I think you got your PhD only about 13 years ago, he's um, published over 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals. This is thanks to Google, um, because Eric mentioned you can find anything on the internet. So he's published over 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He's been cited over 5,000 times in the last five years alone. Um, has an H index close to 40. For the non-science people in the room, that's really big. That's, that's a really impressive figure. Um, and just recently, Eric's groups had an article um, accepted in a leading art, uh, journal, Nature Photonics. So he really is a, a, a leading researcher in many ways. Maybe the last hallmark of a, or another hallmark of a great scientist, um, and again Eric touched on this tonight, which is quite nice, is somebody who's the capacity to make complex material um, and subject material quite comprehensible um, to other people, to a wide ranging audience. I think we all appreciate that tonight. Um, it wasn't a big lesson in th physics, but we all came away understanding something. I'm really pleased because as you saw, he does outreach activities, and it's very easy, I suspect, for a physicist to traumatise children forever <laughs> by trying to explain theoretical physics to them. Um, clearly, they're, they're turned on by physics um, as a result of Eric's explanations. So, although the focus of tonight is on Eric's success as a researcher, I've got to add that he's also a great teacher, he's a great supervisor, some of his students are here tonight, he contributes to the wider university purposes, and he's a really nice guy along with all of that, so he ticks all the boxes from my point of view. So we're very um, fortunate to have Eric as part of our academic community. So Professor LaRue, on behalf of your academic family, the university and everyone here tonight, I thank you for your lecture and I wish you every best for the, your future work. Thank you.